Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand. We want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side. Okay, let's get started. Part two. Now we're going to move from all the covenants, and really the entire part one was just an introduction and a foundation, believe it or not. Now is the fun part. That doesn't mean I'm going to be here for three hours. Uh, but it does mean that all of that is important because what most people want to start at is the New Covenant. That's where we want to start at. When we talk about the New Covenant is we want to start in the New Covenant. But you can't start in the New Covenant. You have to start with all of the previous covenants before that. And what we're trying to do is create a pattern of how God lived with His people and dealt with His people. If we know how He dealt with His people in the past... He's the God, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not make up new methods. Did you know that? I hate to disappoint you. He repeats and glorifies previous methods. Because it's not as if his previous method was inadequate. If you say that he comes up with new ideas, then you're saying that his previous idea wasn't good enough. He should have thought of something better, and so God is evolving. No. Who is the problem here? The method? or the people. We are the problem. Okay, So let's move through the New Covenant here and let's find out exactly what it is. Because for some of you, this concept of the New Covenant, if we let the Bible describe it, is going to absolutely revolutionize your thought process on how you relate to God. It's going to tear apart the thing that Jesus and Paul tried to tear apart in the New Testament, which is to get rid of the man-made doctrine and tradition so that you're left with just the truth. Now, before we start the second half of this teaching, I want to ask you a question. Are you okay with the truth being applied to your life? Are you willing to submit to it, no matter what it is? Because although how, I know how shocking the truth may be, if we are not willing to submit our lives to that truth, then this is the chance that you need to leave and you'll get some extra sleep tonight. Okay? The, the truth is something that we should not be scared of. The truth will never hurt you. That's what the enemy wants you to know. The enemy thinks wants you to think that it's going to hurt you. It's going to be bondage. It's, going to, it's always a red flag... When the enemy says, hey, by the way, he didn't really mean that, or it's going to be bondage. Because that means it's a lie, which means it's probably going to free you, because the truth can only do one thing, and what's that? Set you free. The truth can only do one thing, and that sets you free. So let's begin where the new covenant begins, in the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Why? First of all, is there even a need for a new covenant? He's going to explain that. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Who is the covenant made with? No one stops to ask this question, but let's, let's just dig through here. This covenant is not made with the Gentiles. The Christian church at large today has a concept that God dealt with His people this way, 
they're called Israel, or the chosen people. We're not really sure what he's doing with them today, but he'll figure it out. It's kind of our philosophy. Then we have the Christian church on this side, or the Gentiles. We're under the new covenant. Is that what the scriptures say? That the new covenant is for the house of Gentiles? Who is the new covenant for? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. And he specifically says the house of Israel after those days. So my question to you is, are you part of the house of Israel? Are you part of the house of Judah? And before we go any further... I think it would be very important and worthwhile the time to explain these two terms. I'm not going to ask you what you think that is, but this is ancient Israel, okay? Looks more like a piece of cheese, but a shank bone. This here, these two, these are 12 tribes of Israel. Ten in the north, two in the south. The two in the south are called who? Judah. And Benjamin. Okay? Together, those two tribes are called the house of Judah. Okay, The other ten tribes in the Scriptures are called by a couple of different names. Number one and foremost is the house of Israel. This is the confusing part for most Christians, is when we hear the word Israel in the Scriptures, we're immediately thinking of Jewish people. But that is not the definition that the Bible gives. The Jewish people come directly from who? Judah. Makes sense. Okay. When the ten tribes were taken into captivity, and when the two tribes down here, the southern kingdom was taken into captivity into Babylon, the southern kingdom came back. That's why there's such thing as Jewish people today. There would be no such thing as Jews at all if Judah would not have come back. Does everybody follow me? These people up here, at one time, by the way, these were all called what? Israelites. Okay? Because from Yahweh's perspective, this whole nation was never to be divided, was it? It was supposed to be one nation under God, indivisible, Okay, with justice and liberty for all. Where do you think the Founding Fathers got that from? All right, it was supposed to be un indivisible. One nation called Israel, my people. Okay, so from his perspective, when he says Israel, he can mean the whole nation, both houses, or he could be talking about the house of Israel. Most of the time when he says house of Israel, most all the time, he said, when he designates House of Israel, he's specifically talking about the northern ten tribes. That's very important. Very, very important. Do not assume when you see Israel that it means Jews. You'll be very mistaken. Now, in the first century, when you said Israel, you could mean the Jews. Why? Because the only people in Israel at the time were the House of Judah. And they, they were the only people left of the Israelites, so it was called Israel. You'll see in the New Testament, you'll see house of Israel, and you'll see Israel. Okay? A lot of times they're two different things. You've got to look at the context. So, it's also called the house of Ephraim. Anybody know who Ephraim is? One of the sons of Joseph. Okay? They got the double portion blessing that was passed to Ephraim. So it's the house of Israel and the house of Ephraim. So if you're reading through the Old Testament and you see the house of Ephraim, or when he says Ephraim and Judah, it's talking about the house of Israel, house of Judah. 
One day they're going to become one again. Right now they're split. The ten tribes went into the nations. They never came back from Assyria. They got spread out through the entire world, literally. Lost their identity completely. Okay? Yahweh says, after all of these covenants that He made with His people, that they broke, they broke, they broke, they broke, they broke, 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 broke. He says, okay, time for another covenant. But this time, it's going to be different. It's going to be unlike any other covenant that I've ever made in the past. I'm going to give them the, the ability to put it in their heart. Okay? That is what's getting ready to happen right here. He only makes this covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, for somehow 1,800 years in Christianity, in most religious circles, we dichotomize. We we're not part of Israel whatsoever. This is a Gentiles. The gospel came to the Gentiles. Remember, the branches were broke off of the olive tree so the Gentiles could be grafted in. And no one stops to think or ask the question, who's the covenant actually with? This I am spending some time on because this is the underlying premise and foundation of everything I'm going to say from this moment on is who the covenant is made with. It's made with the house of Israel. So you need to choose which one you're part of. Now if you are Jewish, it's very simple. You're from the house of Judah. You already know that. If you do not have Jewish ancestry, then it's very simple. You're from the house of Israel. Does everybody follow me? There's only two choices. Mm -hmm. Either you're Jewish and you're from the house of Judah, or you're not Jewish and you're from the house of Israel. This is biblical thought. Because there's only two choices. If there was a miscellaneous choice, we, we would choose that one too. And us Greeks are just like that. God gives two choices and we add another one. You know, none of the above. I mean, that's just exactly the way we are, right? There's no none of the above. It's either A or B. Okay, let's move on. Was the promise of the new covenant the first time that Yahweh tried to get His people to obey Him and keep the law with their heart? Somehow this has crept into our minds. Oh, it's written on our heart now. Okay? It's written on our heart. He's going to write the new covenant. He's going to write the law on our heart. New. New. See the Greek thought coming through? This is a new thing he's done. He's never done this before. But what does new mean from his perspective? What does new mean today if you have a contract? I work with a lot of contracts. Okay? I have, I have agents that I send out contracts to. If I change one single thing, for instance, let's say a commission statement. I have a, a contract that has a, a, an 8% commission. And let's say that they do a really good job over time, and I move their commission to 10%. What do I have to do? Is the old contract null and void? Absolutely. It's old. It is worthless and void and passing away. But does that mean, here's the Greek thought, worthless? Does that mean that in the new contract, there's not going to be things from the old contract? You see my point? Greek concept says, old contract, every single word is different. New, in the legal language of today, means this. If you change one letter in a contract, it is broken. It is old. It is worthless and void in a court of law. It's a new contract. If you change one single character, which in my case is a number, from 8% to 9%, the entire contract is called a new contract. But did anything change outside of the commission schedule? You see my point? Hebrew thought understands this. New just means something changed. You get that? you got to get that or we can't go any further. New just means something changed in the contract. It can't be the same contract. It's not the same contract because something changed. So this is not the first time. Somehow in our Greek mindset, we got the idea this is the first time that God's going to write it on our heart. He's never wanted to do that before. Well, let's put that to rest. 
Joshua 22.5 says, But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, to love your Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Isaiah 51.7, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. Psalm 40, verse 8, David says, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. My son, do not forget my law, but let let your heart keep my commands. How do you do that? Proverbs 3, Solomon, greatest, wisest man that's ever lived, says this, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. But it's not possible. You can't do that yet. God had not invented that concept yet, right? I know I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but the truth is, is we've got to get rid of this Greco mindset that new means never came up before. Proverbs 7, 3, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Psalms 37, 31, David says the law of his God is in his heart. None of his, his steps shall slide I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And lastly, Psalms 119.34, Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. I could keep going, folks. Jeremiah 31, I hate to tell you, is not the first time that God said, Finally, all of us angels got together. We figured out what we're going to do. We're going to write it on your heart. No, that has been the intention from the very beginning. He wanted Adam to follow him with his whole heart. He wanted Noah, Abraham, and David, everyone, to follow God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Nothing matters outside of that. Love is the pinnacle. When the teachers asked Yeshua, what is the greatest of all the laws? What do you think he said? Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what I've been trying to tell you for the last 3,000 years. Get it into your heart. He says, How can God's law be written on their hearts if they were not even under the new covenant yet? Now we're calling Scripture a liar. Let me make it personal. Now we're calling David a liar when he says that it was written on his heart. Now we're calling the wisest man that was on earth a liar because he's telling us something that we can't do. Write it on your heart. Apparently, there was a few people in Scripture that had the ability to write it on their heart. They loved it. Anybody have an idea why David was the only man in Scripture called a man after God's own heart? Because he loved the heart of God more than any other man. And you know what the heart of God is defined in Scripture? The first five books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the first letter in Genesis and the last letter in Deuteronomy, when you put them together in Hebrew, it spells heart. The heart of God is the Torah. The heart of God is the Word of God. And the Word of God eventually became flesh. The heart is the Messiah. And the Messiah is the Word. And the Word is the instruction manual. What Jesus was, was the living instruction manual. How cool is that? He said, I didn't come to bring anything new. I only say what I hear my Father saying. And guess what it was? The Greek mindset says it's something new. The Hebrew mindset says, well, He told us in the garden. We lost it. He wrote it down. We we screwed that up. So He said, that's it. I'm coming down there. Anybody ever seen the billboard? Don't make me come down there. God. Why did He come down? Because we didn't get it the first seven times. He came to teach us something new. No, my friends. It's not something new. There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon meant that. Even every parable that Jesus told was common in His day. He just changed the meaning. Old versus new. Watch this. In the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant was instructions for life called commandments. 
We're going to step on some toes here. I'm going to break out some molds. Okay, is it okay? Can we break out some molds today? Yeah. Let's get out of the old and into the new. Right? We, all, we, we like saying that. So let's get out of the old and get into the new mindset. Let's get a Hebrew mindset. Let's get a biblical mindset here. Old Covenant instructions for life called commandments. Proverbs 13, 14. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Okay? So the law was designed to bring someone from death to life. In the new, co- new covenant, the new covenant also was instructions for life. Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter through the gates into the city. Matthew nineteen seventeen. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. That's right on the heels of the rich man coming up to Jesus and saying, Hey, how do I enter the kingdom of heaven? And He says, If you want to enter into life, keep my commandments. Now here's a question. Whose commandments was he talking about? When he said, my commandments. Again, we get into big trouble in our Greek society because we don't like defining things any other way than how we all want to make up our own definitions. What did he mean when he said, keep my commandments? Let me just make this... If Jesus is God... Then when he says, my commandments, which commandments is he talking about? In the first century, there's two things that don't exist. The first century Christian church and the New Testament. So when a Jewish rabbi says commandments, what do you think he means? There is no other commandments. Jesus even said, I do not give you anything but what the Father has already given you. We'll prove that a little bit later, but let's keep going. The way, the truth, and the life. Did you know that the Old Covenant was called the way, the truth, and the life? Proverbs 6.23 says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. In the first century, this is why they really freaked out when Rabbi Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Because in their dialogue, in their culture, in their terminology, the only thing that was the way, truth, and the life was the Torah. That's what it was called. It was the way. Why do you think that the first century Christians were called the sect of the way? It wasn't a new way. I hate to tell you. It was a new way. It was the old way. It was the same way it had always been given from Adam with a new perspective. Psalms 119, 142, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. So right now we have light, truth, and the way. If you walk through Proverbs, by the way, you're going to see all over the place that the way to life is keeping the ordinances and the commandments. Do not stray from them. Do not go to the right or the left. How many times does Solomon say that? How many times does David say he wakes up in the morning? It is light to him. It is life. Okay? So I want you to get the Hebraic concept of the commandments in the Old Testament. It was life. It was not death. That's the Greek mindset. That's our mindset. The commandments in the Old Testament were life, the way, and they were the light. Which means that if you did not have the commandments, you walked against the way, you walked towards death, and you were in darkness all the time. As a matter of fact, what's interesting about that is if you did not keep the commandments, then God was very true to His Word. You walked in darkness, you ended up becoming in bondage, and the blessings did not come to you. Okay? All right. In the New Covenant... There is this concept of the way, truth, and the life. Jesus said that, right? John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, a Jewish rabbi or a good Jewish boy who grew up learning that the Torah is the way, the truth, and the life is having issue with this. Why? What is Jesus calling himself? The living Word of God. That is blasphemous in the first century. It wasn't just this cool thought. Oh, he's the way, truth, and life. And we go around quoting that. No, 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 no. He might as well have said, that book that you devote yourself to is me. I'm the one that can understand it, not you. I will teach you what it means. Because I am the Word. I am the Torah. You see, that's what he was saying. Yeshua taught from age 12 the way of God. Watch this. Luke 20 21. 
Then they had asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly. Remember, he's teaching. What's he teaching? The only scriptures at the time. He's not teaching out of Romans chapter 7. Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. You say way of God in the first century, it only means one thing. It means what it meant in the first century. Which is the only, uh, the only dictionary that they had in the first century was what? The Old Testament. It's the only thing they had. So if the Bible, the Word of God, the Torah says that the way of God is His covenants. Walk in my covenants. Walk in my way. Then what is Jesus doing here? Is He teaching the way of God? But He's doing it differently. He's doing it in truth in contrast to the how religious leaders of the day were teaching it through tradition. You see the difference? Folks, if you grasp this, we can stop here and some of you will probably amen. This is huge. Because what we do today is the same thing as the religious leaders did in the first century. We teach the way through tradition. Yeshua the Messiah taught the way through the truth. That's what made Him so different. And that's ultimately what got him killed. A light to the nations. Now we know all these things in the New Testament, right? The New Covenant's a light. What about the Old Covenant? Designed to be a light to the nations. Did you know that? Isaiah 42, 6. And give thee for a covenant of the people for a light unto the Gentiles. Okay? They were to be a light to the nations. In the New Covenant, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. Now again, in our Greco-Roman mindset, and part of it is not Greco-Roman, part of it is someone put these glasses on us. Let's just admit it. Someone taught us, someone taught you, that you are the light of the world. I'm emphasizing that on purpose. You are the light of the world. Meaning that no one else was ever the light before. Or they were, but now you are. Their light switch was turned off. Your light switch is turned on. Okay? No. Listen. Old Covenant, Israel was the light of the world. They were intended to be the light of the world. In the New Covenant, the disciples of Yeshua are called the light of the world. So in a rabbinic first century Hebraic Jewish boy's mind, these teenagers, when he says you're the light of the world... If they know the Scriptures, what are they thinking? Yeah, Isaiah said that. That's right. That's what our purpose-driven life is. It wasn't that they said, Oy vey, wow, he's saying this is the coolest thing I ever heard. Jesus said nothing new. He pulled the commandment out and glorified it in front of them, meaning that He gave it meaning. He brought truth to it. He brought the truth back. He revealed the truth. You are the light. Remember, your parents blew it, but you are the light. Not that I'm starting a new concept that you're going to be the light. I am going to bring back the original meaning that Adam was supposed to be. A light. Simple concept. Payment is death. In the Old Covenant, payment for breaking the law was what? Death. Something had to die. Deuteronomy 11.26, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Something had to die, and lots of animals did. Millions died. Because someone broke the law. Did anything change in the New Covenant? Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, we focus so much on the gift that came, the comma. I'm picking on on, on us tonight, folks, because we've been taught wrong. Our focus is so Greek that we don't stick on the first half of the verse and define it. 
let me say this again, the way that, that the readers would have heard this. The wages of breaking the law of God is death. And by the way, we are in Romans. We are under the New Covenant times now. How is it possible that the wages of breaking the law is death under the New Covenant? If there's no law. How can we break something that doesn't exist? Can I ask just a logical question? Did anything change in this regard? The payment of sin is death. It's still death. It will always be death when you break the law of God. You see, Greek mindset, sin means nothing. Sin is whatever we want it to be. That's why people are confused about, can I drink, can I not drink? And everybody, every denomination has their own thought on whatever sin is. And the Bible is true. That when you remove the covenant restrictions, and when you remove the covenant blessings, people make up whatever they want. And there's a way that seems right to man. Everyone is bent towards their own way. By the blood. The old covenant. Forgiveness was offered through the blood of animals. Was it not? There's no forgiveness without the remission of sins without blood. Forgiveness is offered eternally through the blood of the Lamb of Yahweh. The New Covenant and the Old Covenant are identical in every term that we just saw. You all see that? Every single one. Nothing's changed yet in principle. Solutions have been added. Underlying principle and foundation, non-changed. From the heart. Well, now we know in the New Testament right here, Romans 3.31, do we not... Uh, well, let's, let's go here. Old Covenant. Was intended to be kept through the heart, through faith. Psalms 48. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your laws from the heart. We went through all those scriptures. Clearly, the Old Covenant was designed to be kept through the heart. Are we taught that growing up in Sunday school? No. The heart didn't come till Grace. See how the deception, just, just a slight deception. It really is not that big a deal, but when you, ch you just barely change that, you miss a lot. In the, New in the Old Testament, it was intended to be kept through the heart in the New Covenant. Romans 3.31 says this about this dilemma of the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant because they misunderstood Paul. Romans 3.31 says, Do we then make void the law of God just because Jesus came? Which is what faith means through faith. Context is Jesus. He says, God forbid, yea, we establish the law of God. Remember all the covenants that I had lined up here? And every one I said, did, you, did it change? Did it get rid of? Did it destroy? And everyone said, no, 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 no. Somehow, when we get to the New Covenant, we have this idea that just because Jesus came and solved the problems of the older covenants, that there is no older covenants. I mean, why do people think that, though? I mean... Because every one of us have been put on a pair of glasses. We've been taught from a Greco-Roman mindset that God is evolutionary in His dealings with man. That He's getting better. But none of the apostles thought that, of course. They were Hebrews. They understood. It was not until the Gentile church fathers got in the mix and started writing about the New Covenant, that they redefined the New Covenant from their Gentile pagan backgrounds, their Greek backgrounds. And guess what? Your great-granddaddy was one of those. That's the problem. Let's move forward. We're just going to let the Bible speak. A covenant forever. The Old Covenant was intended to be a covenant for His people forever. Did you know that? I was not taught that. Second Kings 17.37 In the statutes, the ordinances, the law, and the commandment which He wrote for you, you shall be careful to observe for a few years. Until I change my mind. Until the Messiah comes. Forever means 
forever. And folks, if you want to play with this word, then you're not saved forever. You will not have eternal life forever. You pick and choose what forever means. I choose to believe He meant what He said, and He said what He meant. Psalms 119-44, So shall I, David, keep your law continually forever and ever and ever, he says. He didn't just say forever. He just forever and ever. And we think Walt Disney made that up, right? No. Forever and ever. New covenant was intended to be a covenant for His people forever. Did you know that? Of course we know that. Hebrews 7.17 says, For he testifies you are a priest of the new covenant forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So here's the question. So if the two covenants are so similar in structure, then why is the new covenant new? If someone wouldn't have used the term new covenant, would we even be in this mess? <laughs> See, it's our Greco fast food, you know, mindset that when we hear the word new, we're pre-programmed to believe that everything is old. I have a new computer, I throw out the old. I got a new trash bag, I throw out the old. I got a new car, I sell the old. You see what I'm saying? We are, I mean, it's just a way of life. New things, old goes out with the garbage. In Hebrew, all the people that come and steal your trash before the trash people get are Hebrews. <laughs> They understand the value of all. Those are called garage sales, by the way. <laughs> if you like to go garage sailing, you're probably Hebrew. Because you see the value in something that's older. Here's why. Here's why the New Covenant is called new. Now pay attention, because you're not taught this in Sunday school. The high priest to the high priest... In the Old Covenant, it was administered by a human high priest. The New Covenant was administered by the high priest, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Okay, Why is that significant? Hebrews 8.6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Does that say anything that the older promises are worthless. If I give my agents 8% commission and I, and I give them another 2%, that makes it better. Does it mean that the previous contract was horrible? And that I blew it and that I should have wrote it differently to begin with? No, it means I added something to it that is better. So the covenant is better. Greek mindset, better, throw out something that oh, it must have been horrible. And by the way, let me throw this in the mix. From a first century Hebrew's point of view, Paul, who was a rabbi, they understood the law only did three things. It defined the boundaries of sin, and it did what? Blessed or cursed. So if you broke it, guess what? You're under what? Now you'll understand Paul when he writes and talks about the curse of the law. What did the Greek mindset say? What are the glasses that we've been told on? Come on, some of your light bulbs are going on. The law is a curse. We reverse it because we're Greek. A plus B is C, so C equals B plus A. Mm -mm. The law is a curse to those who break it. Now Romans 3.23 should make a whole lot more sense. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have broke the law. So all are under a curse. There's the problem. The old covenant didn't solve the problem. You see where I'm going here. We need a solution. For if the first covenant had been faultless then no place would have been sought for the second. We all stop there. But is that? does it say that the first covenant is faultless? It says it was found faultless, but then it's going to define what that means in the next verse. Watch this. Because finding fault with the covenant, 
Is that what it says? It says, because finding fault with them. Who's them? The people that were keeping inside the covenant. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. He found fault with them. So who does he need to fix? Them. Them. Folks, this is like... I need to keep going. Them. (laughs) What was the problem? Them. They kept breaking the covenant. From the day one in Adam to all the way through to the time of the Messiah, everyone kept breaking the law. So everyone was getting curses all the time. Because remember, the law only does three things. Curses, blesses, and defines sin. You break it today, you're under a curse. You kill someone today, you're in jail. You steal $65 billion, you get off (laughs) scot-free. Only in America. You get more money. That's right. (laughs) Say that again, curses, blesses. It blesses, it curses, and it defines sin. The human priests that were making sacrifices for the people had to make sacrifices for themselves. Why? Because they sinned. Therefore, there was no end to the problem. Again, he break, cycle, problem, never goes away. People sin, have to make a sacrifice. People sin, eventually, if God doesn't solve this problem, we're going to be out of animals. No more cats. He came back way too early. (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. I love cats. (laughs) Therefore, there was no end to the problem. The people had nothing deep inside them that gave them the desire to keep the covenant. And because there was no perfect sacrifice, the blood of animals had to continually be spilled. What was the solution? To give us help. Therefore, it's called the Helper. John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. Teach you what? All new things? That's what we're taught. All things. All things. Whatever you want it to be. Want to teach you calculus? He'll teach you calculus. (laughs) Watch this, guys. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the things I said to you. And what did He say to them, Luke said? He taught them what? The way. Through the truth. That's the remembrance He's talking about. We've been taught that Jesus came up with a bunch of new ideas, and that's what we got to keep. Therefore, Christianity has said this, I know I'm being hard on Christianity, but I am one. I grew up in the same boat. But the reality is, is it it should be okay to audit. Should it not? It should be okay to question. Because that's what Jesus did in the first century. He said, I want to find out what is of the Father and what is of the tradition and doctrine of men. The only way you're going to be set free, my friend, is to do that. Unfortunately, the people that ask questions normally get kicked out first. (laughs) Here's what's going on. He sends the Helper to help them do what the Father has told them to do, but they couldn't do it on their own. Do you know what the word righteous means? To live right. How does the Scriptures define in the first century what it meant to live right. Read Psalm 119. To walk in your ways that bring life. They're a light to my path. It is the way to life is the covenant. You see? It's to bring to remembrance what the Messiah taught them about the way. Because up until the Messiah, they were taught wrong about the way because the way was taught through tradition and doctrine of men. Now you know what two-thirds of the New Testament is about because almost every epistle that Paul wrote is railing on the doctrine and tradition and the laws of men. When you see the word law... Do not assume it means Mosaic Law. Because there's another law in the New Testament. Two, to be exact. The law 
of sin and death, the law of God, and the law of man. And did you know in the first century, Jewish law, when a rabbi said law, or when the circumcision party said law, they meant all of the written law and the oral law. Same today. When you talk to a Jewish person today, make sure you define written law. Because in their synagogue, when they say law, it means all of the traditions and the laws of the, of the rabbis and the law, the law of God. That's the problem. Because we're Greco-Roman Christians growing up in a 21st century Western you know, church. We're not taught that in the first century that's what law is. So when we see Paul railing on the law, it appears as if he's railing on God's law. But then he's schizophrenic because he says that it's not void. He upholds it. And Timothy says it's great and is for all reproof and doctrine and instruction and way of righteousness. Someone's wrong here. It can't be one or it's got to be one or the other. But we're seeing both because they're against the oral law. They're against the tradition, you see. The solution was to give us a perfect high priest so that the blood would only have to be shed once for all time. There's only two problems with the Old Covenant. And we see it right here. They had blood had to be spilt continually. And they had no help. <clears throat> only one man had the ability to stand in the presence of God. And that was only once a year. So when the curtain was ripped at 3 o'clock, when Jesus died on the cross that day, every man had the opportunity to sit in the presence of God because the Holy Spirit, when it came down on the, on the day of Pentecost, it spread out as tongues of fire on every man had the Helper. Every man had access to the Holy of Holies through the High Priest. Bottom line, when one man, where once man had no ability to come into the presence of the Almighty because of his sin, breaking the law. Now he finally had a helper to help him not sin, not break the law. See the significance of putting the definition in there. When we say sin, we don't even know what that means. How do you define it? If the law of God, I'm sorry, if the law of God is just a beautiful picture that we can look back into time and say, look at the value that it had for that time period. But it has no relevance today, then you cannot sin. Because sin is the breaking of it. There is no other definition. And if he did sin, he could boldly go before the throne of heaven with the blood of King Yeshua on the doorpost of his heart. Boldly. That's what it meant, guys. The reason why he said you can boldly come before the presence of God, the throne, because you couldn't do that before. There ain't no boldly about it. Even the priest wore a little rope on, a, on an ankle with some bells. And he probably backed in into the Holy of Holies. Just in case. Did the New Covenant destroy all the previous covenants? If it did, then this is the first time in history. And if it did, we have a big problem. And God's a liar because I'm still working. The land doesn't just produce automatically for me. Okay? Matthew 5.17, watch this, folks. The biggest problem between Paul and Jesus and the people is they misunderstood Him. Jesus was teaching against the law, the Pharisees thought. Why? Did the Pharisees think he was teaching against the law? Why did they accuse him of teaching against the law? Why did they accuse Paul of teaching against the law? Because their definition of the law was all of it. The tradition, the doctrine, and the Torah. You see? That's why they accused him. But because we don't know that, we think that when Jesus is walking along in the wheat field on the Sabbath and he takes some, some wheat and rubs it between his fingers and they accuse him of breaking the Sabbath, we say, see... Even Jesus broke the Sabbath. That law is nowhere to be found in the Torah. But you know where it is found? There is an actual law, in rabbinical oral law, that says that you cannot take one grain of wheat and put it between your fingers. That's called work. <laughs> Think not, Matthew 5.17, that I have come to destroy the law, the Old Covenant, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill... This is on the Sermon on the Mount. To fulfill 
means to fill up its in meaning to make overflowing. Complete understanding. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall no wise pass from the law. Which law? The only law in existence at the time. Till all be fulfilled. Verse 19, watch this carefully. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of the commandments. What does he mean by commandments? The law. And shall teach men to do so. Meaning what? Let's just be honest. If you break the least of the commandments and teach others to break the commandments, how could you teach someone to break the commandments? Do you physically have to tell them, break the commandment of God? Does it, is that the way the enemy works? What does the enemy say? He didn't really mean it. You don't have to really do that. You're under grace. You teach someone to break the law if you don't tell them there even is one. They're breaking it. He shall be called what? Least in the kingdom of heaven. So, listen. But whoever shall do and teach the commandments shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because if you teach and you do the, key, the, the commandments, then you are drawing people into His heart. You're drawing them into a relationship where they can receive the blessings. You see what I'm saying? Understanding and receiving the Messiah is just the blessing of eternal life. I know this doesn't jive with what we've been taught, but this is what the Scriptures say. There's a lot of misunderstood Scriptures. Did it change them? Yes. It fixed them and restored them. All the previous covenants. He fixed us and restored us. It fixed the problem of sin that brought death that started in the Edenic Covenant. The prophecy of the seed of the woman breaking the head of the serpent serpent in the Adamic covenant for what he did in the garden found fulfillment in the new covenant. It gave more meaning to the Noahide covenant of being saved through water and through one man's obedience the world was saved. The prophecy that the Messiah would come through the Abraham covenant was fulfilled. The new covenant made the Mosaic covenant perfect in the fact that the administrator of it is perfect. And all the types and shadows that were dimly understood before now have been made clear in the Messiah. This, my friends, is the covenant. All those blocks build on one another. From Abraham, from the Edenic covenant, all the way through to the new covenant. If you remove one single block from that pyramid, it will fall. It will have a faulty foundation. Today, in the religious world that people call Christianity, that I call Christianity, under our own umbrella, we have a weak foundation. Somehow our house is crumbling right out from underneath us. And no one wants to say that it's right in front of your eyes. It is not in heaven that you should say, Father, where's the solution? Or it's across the ocean. We need to go get it. It is right in front of us. Our forefathers dropped the ball and we never picked it up. We grabbed onto the Messiah. And so we get all the blessings that are found there. But there is so much more. Lastly, we're going to define this. This is the pinnacle of everything that I said up until this point. The exclamation point will be from this moment forward over the next five minutes. If you're going to, Jim, say all of these things, my friend, I always thought Israel was over here. Those are the children of Israel. I am a Gentile. The law was given to the Jews. The new covenant was given to the Gentiles. Let's see if that's scriptural. The meaning of the word Israel, remember each Hebrew letter means something. It actually literally means one who rules with God or one who struggles with God. Remember Jacob, his name was changed to Israel when he wrestled with the Lord. 
angel of the Lord, his name was changed to Israel. Why? Because he struggled with God and he won, which means he has the right to rule with God. Don't say that life is not supposed to be a struggle, but your struggle is supposed to be against the flesh through the Spirit. And you deserve the right to rule with him at the end of time. Okay? Israel means one who rules with God. Who is prophesied to rule over the enemy at the end of time? The Messiah. Who is his bride in the Old Testament? Israel. Who? Israel. Israel is his bride in the Old Testament. We're going to get rid of the confusion because in Christianity there's no doubt, even in my own mind, I had so much confusion on the Jewish people and Israel and the Christians and who are, it's like, who are all these people and how do they fit into this Scripture, New Testament covenant thing? This is going to be very simple. Who is the bride in the Old Testament? Israel. Israel. Isaiah 6, 20, 6, 62, 5. Who is His bride in the New Testament? Israel. His people. You're ahead of me. In the Greek, it's called ecclesia, the congregation. In the Hebrew, it's called kahal. Kahal is congregation. Okay? Assembly. His people. Not church. That word is not found in the New Testament. It's ecclesia. It's congregation. Coming from the counterpart in the Hebrew, kahal. His people are the bride. Is Yahweh endorsing polygamy? Because at this point, I see two brides. We have Israel, and we got this thing that we all call the church. Would you agree we're all confused? Is Israel the bride, or is the church the bride? Who is the bride? Well, we know that Yahweh does not endorse polygamy. Um, if we are different than Israel, as defined in the Bible, and the Israel of the Bible is prophesied to return to Him at the end of time, then there will be two brides? So either original Israel will be grafted into our tree or we're going to be grafted into their tree. There cannot be any other options. There is no none of the above. Israel is the bride in the Old Testament. His people are the bride in the New Testament. We call it the church. That's where the confusion comes in. It's never called the church. It's called the assembly. The congregation of the saints. In the Old Testament, it's the congregation in the wilderness. The congregation of saints. It's the same term. Why did they change it to church? By the way, you'll even see the word church and the Greek word is synagogue. Someone explain that to me. How the translators took a very clear word called synagogue and put the English word church there. Do you think there might be some anti-Semiticness going on there? They didn't want you to know they were meeting in a synagogue. Back to our story. So either Israel will be grafted into our tree or we're grafted into their tree. So let's define Israel of the Old Testament. Exodus 12, 48. This is key, folks. This is it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, coming right out of the Exodus, and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. So the stranger is an Egyptian. Wants to be a child of God. What's he have to do? Keep the covenant. And he guess what? He becomes as one who is native. An Israelite. Did the Israelite become Egyptian? Is there such thing as an Israelite and Egyptian in God's kingdom? Is there male and female? There is Israelite. Israel, my people, one who rules with me. That's the name. Okay? Those that are natural born Israelites and those that are spiritual Israelites, obedient to the covenant, are called Israel. Watch this. You're, you're, gonna, you're fixing to catch a concept that Paul understood fluently. And this is where we get mixed up. We need to get back to what Paul's talking about because this is where the mix-up happens right here in Romans chapter 11. We're going to read this. Concept of the olive tree. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild... I'm talking about the Gentiles. And you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them 
And with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the other branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will then say, branches were broken off, meaning the Jewish people, the house of Judah, were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief in the Messiah, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. By the way, why do you think they were broken off? Is it just because they they didn't believe in the Messiah? They didn't believe God, the Father. Because Yeshua said, if you don't believe me, then you're not believing the Father who sent me. See, salvation always rested on belief and walking out your belief through faith. That's why Abraham was righteous. It says he believed God and followed that up through his actions. He became righteous. He was righteous. Same thing here. The Jews did not believe in in Messiah, which means they stopped believing in God. 21, For if God did not spare the natural branches, He may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God. The goodness and the severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness. If, if, again, here comes the covenant, if you continue in His goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in again, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted in contrary to your nature, into a cultivated olive tree. How much more... Who does the cultivating, by the way? Okay, so up until this point, before the Messiah, there was a cultivated olive tree. Does anybody read that any differently? There's a cultivated olive tree. You're grafted into the cultivated olive tree. It means it existed before you got there. It's already cultivated. How much more will these, who are natural branches, branches be grafted into their own olive tree at the end of time? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What's the mystery? Twofold. The mystery is that the angels long to look into in the Old Testament, which is a whole other teaching that I'm going to do, but how is he going to get the Gentiles, the goyim, the nations, to be part of his people? How is he going to do that? How is he going to save the world? Because the Israelites are lost. They never came back. So from the angel's point of view, how on earth? It's impossible now. It's impossible. Everyone's lost their identity. There is a way. And so all Israel will be saved. As written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Ungodliness from Jacob. What what is defined ungodliness in the Old Testament? Can we define that? What is ungodliness? Breaking the commandments is the ungodliness of Jacob that drew, drove them into being scattered throughout the rest of the world. For this is my covenant with them when I will take away their breaking of the law. Breaking of the law. When I take away their sins. Okay? Now, let's define this. What is the olive tree? This is an olive tree in Israel. Okay? Pretty wild looking thing. But what is it? Jeremiah 11. You know what we're taught in Christianity is this. This is what I grew up teaching and learning. Is that we are grafted into the Messiah. Okay? Messiah is the olive tree. That is making up our own definitions. We have got to let the first century scriptures define. And what were the first century scriptures? The Old Testament. Do you think Paul the rabbi, who grew up learning about the olive tree, is just making up a new analogy called the olive tree? And has this brilliant stroke of genius to say that the Gentiles are grafted into this cool looking olive tree and comes up with this amazing analogy. The Jewish people know exactly what he's talking about. That's why they're freaking out, because the mystery has been solved. That they didn't understand. So let's go back and find out, from Paul's point of view, what's he pulling from? Jeremiah 11.16 is where he's getting it from. Speaking to his people Israel, he says, The Lord called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. And I wish it stops there, but it doesn't. 
It says, with the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. The mist- He's not talking about Romans 11. He's talking about the fact that they broke the law of God, and the two houses, the two sticks were broken. And one of them was sent into the nations. And the mystery was, how on earth is he going to get back his people? Because it's prophesied that they're going to be back. It can't happen. It's impossible. And in and, and Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about the same two parts of the olive tree that are broken in half and how they're going to be brought back together. And all Israel are going to be saved. House of Israel and the house of... All of Israel. Why does he say all of Israel? How do we interpret that? All of the Jewish people. Because of our lack of understanding of what Israel is. Israel is not the Jewish people. That's two-tenths of the Jewish people, of, of the Israel. The other 80% is the house of Israel. When they get it, and they're grafted in, all Israel will be saved. You get it? All Israel. Both houses. What is the root then? If the, if the tree is Israel, the olive tree is actually called Israel, then the root is this. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an sign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and, the, and his rest shall be glorious. What do you think it's talking about there? The Messiah. Revelation 5.5, 5, just to make it very clear, so I'm not reading in anything. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which we know is Yeshua, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals thereof. And just to make it ultimately very clear, Revelation 22.16, John says, I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the Root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. You see, what we're supposed to be, folks, Israel was a tree. It was a branches. Israel is the tree. The people are the branches. And it spreads over across the nations. And what are the branches supposed to produce? Fruit. Anybody remember any, any parables that talk about this? A tree that does not produce good fruit is worthless and is cut down and thrown in the lake of fire. Why? Because the purpose of Israel from the very beginning was to be a light unto the nations. It was to be fruit that would grow such green olives that they would drop into the hands of the nations and they would say, what God is this God that creates ordinances and commandments that blesses you so greatly? I want to know this God. You see, that's the purpose of the olive tree, to produce fruit for the nations. And the fatness of the olive tree comes from the root the Messiah, which is hidden under the ground. The Old Covenant is hidden, you see. The Messiah is the Old Covenant made flesh. Watch this. Therefore, in Ephesians 2.11, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by the Jewish people, the circumcision, that at that time you were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Let me say that again. They're aliens from it. They can't have it. They're far from it. You were once strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. What are the covenants of promise? Folks, come on. There's promises in all these covenants. They can't have them because they're strangers from it. But now, in the Messiah, you who were once far off from what? The covenants have now been brought near to the covenant by the blood of Jesus. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers. It can't get any clearer than this. And foreigners, pulling from Exodus, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. 
He's pulling this right out of what we read earlier. If the aliens and sojourners want to come with you, they need to be part of the covenant. They need to keep my covenant. And they will get all of the promises inside the covenant. Is he coming up with this new stroke of genius here in Ephesians 2? Or is he saying the same thing of the same thing of the same thing? The purpose of Israel, surely I've taught you the statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all the statutes and say, Surely this great nation is wise and an understanding people. For what great nation is there that God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon Him? And what great nation is there that such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I have set before you this day? Are you kidding me? Who in their right mind would think that the world would want to be part of a system of a bunch of rules and regulations? But that is what Yahweh said. Because we focus on our Greek mindset on the rules and regulations. But from the perspective of the nations, they're seeing fruit. Their tree is drought. Joseph has food. They come to the food. They come to the blessing. We've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Purpose of the followers of Messiah? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Did the followers of Messiah take the place in the purpose of Israel? Or is it the same message to the same group over and over again? It's not two different groups. It's the same group with the same covenant with a new high priest. And no man-made tradition and doctrine. That is the definition of the new covenant. So if God has one chosen people called Israel, those that rule with God, the green olive tree, and we as believers in our high priest Yeshua have grafted into that olive tree called Israel, then by default we are grafted into all of her covenants as well. Are we not? If you are not Israel, then forget about the covenants. But forget about the blessings as well. And my friend, if you forget about the covenants, you are still under the curse because the curse of the law is for anyone that breaks it and that's how unsaved people end up in the lake of fire is because there is such thing as the old covenant. And there is such thing as instructions and decrees and ordinances and commandments. If there was not, there would be nothing to judge by and the Messiah would have no right to put anyone into the lake of fire. Because what would He say that you broke? The commandments found in the New Testament? You go down that road, then get rid of the rest of it. Then it's truly not worth anything. If you say that, then the entire 39 books are worthless and they're stories for your children that have some sort of spiritual value. Spiritual value never brings righteousness. Physical reality brings righteousness. It was not enough for Abraham to say, I believe you, I will go where you want me to go, and then stay where he's at. He was given instructions and he followed it. The pattern in the Bible, God gives instructions to His people, we follow, we get blessed. We don't, we get in bondage. The truth that Yeshua brought by teaching the way that He gave to Abraham, to Noah, to Adam, to Moses, finally written down, was to free us from one thing, bondage. One God, Yahweh. One covenant. One law. One Messiah. One people. It makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. 
It's time that Israel become realigned with their God. It's time that Israel become realigned with her God. You only have two choices as a believer in the Messiah. Either you're going to choose to destroy the law and say that it has only numerical and spiritual value then you will end up in Matthew 5.19 and be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus Himself said that not one jot or tittle will fall from that until heaven and earth pass away. And as long as heaven and earth, and last time I checked, it's still here, then we are still in the covenant. You can't have a contract with just 10% commission. And that's the only thing in the contract. There's got to be something for us to do. We wonder why we run ourselves ragged and we're falling apart and marriages end in divorce so fast because maybe part of it might have to do with we're not keeping the Sabbath. We're breaking the seal of our covenant. So we get no rest, so we have no blessing, so curses fall upon us. I could go through the line, I'm not. I'll let you decide. I know for some of you this is shocking information. And this is kind of overwhelming your senses because what I am saying, I'm not going to beat around the bush, is that the old covenant, the law of God, is still in effect for today if you are Israel. And I hate to tell you, but there is no other chosen people. So either you are grafted in or you are not. And if you are, then you better get aligned. So when someone says we need to align with Messianic Israel, we better know what that means. Because you're aligning with your forefathers who were Messianic Israel. Either we are for them or against them. There is one people that will live in the land. And we'll end with what we started with. Either we're going to be not aligned and we'll have curses in our lives. Or we will be aligned and we'll have fresh manna every day. All the blessings of the Bible are found in the covenants of the Bible leading up to the main covenant that supports them all. If you want the blessings that are found in the covenants, then we must first align with them. Do not let the enemy deceive you that he didn't mean it. Yes, there are difficult passages that Paul talks about. I'll give you one. We're no longer under the law, but under grace. We're no longer under the penalty of the law, my friends. We are under grace. That's why it says, if you've read Romans 7 or 8 lately, with my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. In my heart, he says, I'm a slave to sin. And the next verse, 8.1, which should be the last verse of chapter 7, says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the law condemns. If you're in Messiah, there's a new sheriff in town and he pardons all those that are in him. So as you break the law, he pardons you and there's no condemnation from the law. How can the law condemn you if it doesn't exist? Do you see the deception we've swallowed? It can't be a dog and pony show looking through the window. If it's not relevant, you can't be condemned. The first step is understanding who you really are and what your responsibility is to them. Do you want a little water? That's what most of us are getting today. Or do you want a lot of water? It's up to you. It's not a salvation issue. It's a least or great issue. It's a little or a lot issue. Or, do you want this kind of water? 
This is called a river of life. This is what I want. I want a lot of water. I want so much water that I can bathe in it. It'll clean me. Don't let anybody tell you that it's bondage because the only thing that's defined as bondage in the Bible is this. The doctrine and the tradition of men. If it not is so, then God's a liar and David's a liar and Solomon's a liar when he says it's life. How can it be life and death at the same time? Last slide, I promise. This is us. I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. By the way, this is a scripture from the end days. Us. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I have hated it. Doesn't that describe us today? My heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. Rulers, our spiritual rulers have done this. They have made my pleasant portion, my blessings, a desert wilderness. I've been deceived. They have made it desolate, desolate. It mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. Let's pray. I surrender to the King. And all I am, oh yeah. Singing a song of prayer. I surrender to the King.